Okay. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Don't stop until you are proud. <clears throat> Creative. Creative is a group of people who are uh, very eager to gain new knowledge. Creative. Cree means creativity. Active means activeness. <clears throat> creativity. Uh, organize, uh, creative organizing online talks on every weekend. Creative. Vision of creative is to build constructive thinking in various domain. Our spotlight towards non-textual, non-academic, non-syllabus knowledge. I like to uh, brief about uh, our activity. Creative is a platform to share uh, discoveries, innovation, ideas, experiences, experimental facts, reviews to the interested audience. We are very thankful to all our resource persons for their time and knowledge. <clears throat> uh, as we are uh, recognized as space tutors of ISRO, the aim of this program to promote space education and awareness to the student community and public. Under this recognition, we have organized a talk on AstroSat, India, India's first space observatory. The astronomy, sat, uh, astronomy satellite, AstroSat, is India's dedicated multi-wavelength astronomy mission, which is being operated as a space observatory. It has completed nearly seven years in orbit. This talk will provide a glimpse of the capa uh, capability of the satellite and a few of the results. To present this, we have Dr. Sita Ma'am with us today. I welcome uh, Dr. Sita Ma'am for today's session and I welcome all creative participants and creative volunteers for today's session. I invite Ramiza to introduce uh, today's speaker. Over to Ramiza. Good. Myself, Pramiza Banu, and I am also a part of Creative Team. Our today topic is AstroSat, the astronomy satellite shortly called AstroSat. This is India's dedicated multi-wavelength astronomy mission, which is being operated as a space observatory, and it has completed nearly seven years in orbit. And this talk will provide a glimpse of capability of the satellite and a few results, few of the results. To discuss about this wonderful topic, we have Sita Ma'am. She is a principal investigator AstroSat. Now I am going to introduce Sita Ma'am to our participant. Ma'am completed her B BSc in Physics from Hindu College, Delhi University and completed her MSc in Physics at IIT Madras and PhD in Physics from Indian, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Ma'am retired has as outstanding science, scientist in January 2019 after serving ISRO for nearly 39 years. She is also the principal investigator of AstroSite. This is a small introduction about Sita Ma'am and being a part of Creative, I heartfully welcome Sita Ma'am to Creative Weekend Talk. Welcome you Sita Ma'am and also welcome all the participants, volunteers to this weekend section. Thank you, Supriya ma'am, for this opportunity to give a brief introduction about Sita ma'am. Now over to Supriya ma'am. Thank you, Ramiza. <clears throat> ma'am, over to you. Uh, thank you, Supriya, and thank you, Ramiza, for that kind introduction. Um, let me um, welcome again all the listeners, and I hope you will enjoy this talk today. Um, so I will now go on. Can you, Supriya, can you share the screen? Yes, ma'am. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes. Okay, I'll put in presentation mode. Okay. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the uh, AstroSat, as she said, Astronomy's Satellite, shortened to AstroSat. It is India's first space observatory. Next slide. 
So what is a space observatory? Many of you who are unfamiliar with uh, astronomy as such <coughs> may not know what is space observatory. So let me explain to you. Observatories are facilities housing different types of telescopes to observe the universe. Okay, so for example, near Kavalur in India, we have the Vainu Bapu Observatory. Near Mount Abu, we have the Guru Shikhar Observatory. In Hanle, we have the Hubble, uh, Himalayan Chandra Telescope and the other telescopes. In Devasthal near Nainital, we have the largest 3.6 meter telescope. So these are all observatories using optical telescopes to actually see the sky and observe the stars and galaxies in the universe. Um, what is a space observatory? The space observatory actually has telescopes and instruments which are launched on satellite. You would have heard about Hubble Space Telescope. You would have heard about XMM Newton. You would have heard about Chandra Telescope, etc. And AstroSat is also one of them. Uh, so these are space. These are observatories or satellites which have telescopes and instruments which observe the universe. So um, one more aspect of observatories is that many scientists can propose for observation. Though the observatory itself will be operated by one particular institution, there, might, there can be scientists from many, many other institutions who are capable of analyzing that data. They can propose for observations and the observations will be conducted by the team which operates the telescope and the data will be sent to them after observations for analysis by them. And then they will do the scientific analysis and they will publish the paper results. So that is what an observatory is all about. And so AstroSat also operates in that mode where uh, scientists all over the world can send in proposals for observations. Next slide. <clears throat> Next slide, Supriya. Third slide, ma'am. Yeah. So, <clears throat> how did we all start on AstroSat? I'm telling that AstroSat is a big space observatory and it is India's first observatory. Initially, as you know, ISRO started with balloon and rocket experiments. These were, uh, along with ISRO, these were actually flown by Physical Research Laboratory Ahmedabad and the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. And then um, when, we started gave, when we started actually building satellites, we also had science experiments on Aryabhatta and Bhaskara, the first Indian satellites. After that, we had piggyback experiments. That means experiments which were on, put on satellites, Indian satellites, but the satellite itself was not meant for this particular experiment. This was an added experiment on a particular satellite which was meant for other purposes also. So we had the gamma ray burst experiment on the SROS satellite and the Indian X-ray astronomy experiment XAE on IRSP3. IRSP3 was meant for, as a remote sensing satellite, but we pointed to stars using this experiment. This experiment for few months every year. I3, even though it was a remote sensing satellite, for the sake of the X-ray astronomy experiment, we had the capability with a star sensor to actually point to specific stars. This was the first satellite to do what we call stellar pointing. Um, so based on this, on the experience which we learned from this and the capability to actually build instruments indigenously, uh, many scientists proposed that we should have a dedicated astronomy satellite. And accordingly, ISRO formed two working groups and the two working groups submitted reports in 1998, 
finally they made a proposal to isro in 2000 and then isro worked on a satellite which could house these uh, experiments and they may had the project approval in 2004 that is how astrosat came into being um, as a dedicated astronomy satellite next slide slide 4 Yeah. Yes, so now a little about Astrosat. Uh, well, it is not actually a little. It's actually almost all about satellite uh, Astrosat. In brief, India's astronomy satellite Astrosat is a multi-wavelength satellite which can observe stars, stellar systems, and galaxies in ultraviolet and X-rays. Both these wavelengths. simultaneously it was launched on 28 september 2015 using the polar satellite launch vehicle however uh, so it is going to complete 7 years on 28th september 2022 this year astrosat however is not a polar um, satellite it is actually orbiting We are at an altitude of six fifty kilometers above the Earth, so it is a low Earth orbit, and it is an inclination of six degrees. Very very small, as you can see in the adjoining figure. It is nearly equatorial satellite, you can say, just six degree inclination. Why do we want this? Because in the polar orbit, there is there is a lot of charged particle background which can. increase the background in the instruments of astrosat and so we prefer a low inclination orbit <clears throat> so this was the first near equatorial low earth orbit which pslv was for which pslv was used astrosat has five main instruments now in this satellite in this slide i have told you a lot of things which some of you might immediately understand but some of you may not understand i've told about multi wavelength i've told about ultraviolet i've told about x rays etc etc so you might have a lot big question mark about all those so shall we go to some of the fundamentals before we go into some more details next slide supriya <coughs> is yes, ma'am fifth yeah so um, this is what i said is a multi wavelength satellite how do we see the world we see it with the eyes with our eyes right you can see the nice scenery which i have shown here we see the whole world we see the sunrise we see sunset we see the moon and we see everything around us the trees the lakes the rivers etc with our eyes and of course with the brain which interprets all these images so the next question is can we see in total darkness no right how why is that so because the eyes can see only when there is light and this light we call is as the visible wave band or the optical wave band so we see during the day with the help of sunlight which is which we call as white light and in during the darkness we can see with the moonlight or we can see with artificial light like the bulbs tube light etc now the white light itself consists of seven wave bands you would have seen the rainbow right so um, rainbow is where a uh, droplet of water actually disperses the breaks up the white light into different colors so we can see from red all the way to violet red orange yellow green blue and indigo and violet yeah seven colors um so this we call as a vibgyor and i have put 
and 700, we will come to that later. Red corresponds to 700 wavelength nanometers and uh, violet or blue corresponds to 300 nanometers. Now, you would have also heard, so this is all about visible wave, wavelength with which we see the world. So uh, our eyes, are sensitive band. and thing is the visible wave band reaches all the way to the surface of the earth so we can use this visible wave band for seeing the universe and now coming to x-rays many of you would have seen that x-rays are used to detect fractures to see actually bones right so on the right hand side bottom you see the picture which William Rongen, the discoverer of X-rays, he took off his wife's hand and you can see the hands, bones. In uh, So the X-rays passes through the skin, through the tissues, and it is blocked only by the bones. And of course, you can also see the ring which the lady was wearing. So it is also blocked by the upper certain thickness of metal. So I talked about optical, I talked about X-rays. Is there any similarity between visible band and X-rays? So let us see. Next slide, sixth slide. Many of you would have actually read this about sound waves. You might have read about waves in general in your school or college. Wavelength and frequency. Waves, waves when they when they travel, the length between points of a same face, maybe a crest, which is the top of the wave, or the trough, which is the bottom of the wave. So between two crests or two troughs, the length is called the wavelength. So it is a distance measure and it is usually meant, uh, uh, it is measured in unit of length. Like for example, um, what do I call uh, meters, centimeters, millimeters. And when it is very small, it is measured in terms of nanometers, 10 to the power minus nine times nanometers or sometimes even micron 10 to the power minus six meters. Yeah. And frequency is the number of cycles in one second. This tells you about how fast that wave travels. So it gives a time element. So number of cycles in one second is called frequency and its unit is usually hertz. Of course, you can have megahertz, you can have millihertz, et cetera, et cetera. Again, whether it is what you add factor in front of hertz. So you can see one hertz is approximately one and a half wave, one wave in one, one second. And uh, one, uh, three hertz is three waves in one second. So usually, the wavelength is equivalent to the velocity of the wave divided by the frequency in appropriate units. This applies for all waves. Next slide, Supriya. Yes. Now, um, so um, when we come to um, visible wave, X-rays, etc., these are a particular type of waves called electromagnetic waves and here the velocity of traversal is the velocity of light so the velocity will be replaced by c in this case so you see frequency is equal to c by lambda and one more um, relationship is these travel in packets called photons and the energy of a photon is Planck's constant h into frequency or Planck's constant into velocity of light divided by the wavelength. 
and energy is usually measured in ergs or joules is what you would have studied right that is mechanical energy however we use a smaller unit called electron volt which is approximately 10 to the power minus 12 times erg so it is a much smaller unit of energy and blue wavelength corresponds to an energy of about 3 electron volts okay so now we talked about visible wavelength visible wavelength is emitted by our bulbs any any um, incandescent bulb which will emit white light which can be again broken up into seven colors now when you go on the red side you will see night vision goggles or night vision cameras in creative you remember there was a lecture by a uh, lecture on the movement of tigers in forest and they used night vision cameras so these are in infrared and then further if you go tv remote which you use that also operates in infrared then you go further microwave ovens operate in microwave and then radio so these this side of red is increasing wavelength or decreasing frequency because they are inversely proportional on the blue side we have ultraviolet light you have heard about ultraviolet right sun emits ultraviolet and ultraviolet is harmful for the skin and luckily for us in the atmosphere the ozone layer actually absorbs the ultraviolet and therefore we are saved from skin cancer and that is why it is worrisome if the ozone gets depleted and then we come to x rays i already told you x rays are used for studying fracture another application is in the airport security <clears throat> they scan your baggage to see whether there are any things which are not allowed in the aircraft that is also done in x rays and then you have the pet scan which is a medical scan for your uh, brain etc that is done at higher energies which is called gamma rays okay and then of course when very high energy gamma rays can even penetrate through the atmosphere and they can even reach the surface of the earth so these are all corresponding to what we call electromagnetic waves the only difference is the wavelength varies the frequency varies and therefore their properties are different but they are all electromagnetic waves and they are also called transverse waves next slide <clears throat> eighth slide so we observe the universe in different wavelengths so normal sun we see is yellow ball of light however when the sun is you would have uh, read the newspapers you would have seen when there is a total solar eclipse they will show you pictures like the middle picture where the center part of the sun is blocked by the um, by the moon moon shadow and we see the outer parts of the sun which is called the corona and that corona is again seen in optical light but in optical light it is about million times fainter than the central part of the sun and that is why you can't see the corona normally because the central part of the sun is so bright compared to this corona but the corona's temperature is very very high it is million degree kelvin and therefore it is very bright in x rays similarly on the right hand side you see the sun imaged in extreme ultraviolet so you see the outer layers of the sun with either ultraviolet or x rays very very clearly so different aspects of the same object can be better viewed in different wavelengths next slide <coughs> of course in addition to different aspects 
different objects might itself emit in different wave bands for example on the left hand side many of you who have seen the sky have seen stars right and um stars themselves are of different colors actually there are blue stars there are red stars this picture on the left hand side is of orion constellation which we call a hunter um and um there is a red star on the top left hand side and there's a blue star on the bottom right hand side so i don't know if you can see very clearly in this small picture but <clears throat> near the belt there is something called the nebula which is shown in much clearer using the hubble space telescope picture in the middle and it consists of very bright stars and it has a lot of gas and dust and this is called a stellar nursery where new stars are being born and these new stars are very very hot of the order of 100000 degree kelvin um kelvin is another unit of uh, temperature and uh, so uh, which is used for measuring the temperature of stars that doesn't matter one um, minus 273 degrees centigrade is 0 degree kelvin that's all you need to know so uh, this so very very hot stars how do we see we see in ultraviolet wave bands and then when it comes to million degree kelvin we see it in x rays so different objects emit in different wave bands satellites are re required to observe in uv and x rays as i told you they are uv and x rays are absorbed in the earth's atmosphere so you can't see are uh, uv and x rays emitted by some of the hot stars and compact objects um, from the earth so you need to go using satellites to observe the uv emission and x ray emission and that is why astrosat which has uv and x ray experiments is used to used on a satellite next slide so many of you might have heard that black holes are something which we can't observe black holes um nothing escapes from black hole even light cannot escape from black hole so how do we actually study these black holes <coughs> of course black holes are very massive they also modify that the space curvature etc but we are not going there to see the curvature so how do we observe black hole one of the ways to observe black holes is using x rays uh, see uh, around the black hole there is something called the event horizon within that event horizon we cannot observe anything and it is all black whatever happens inside we can't do but outside of that event horizon we can study whatever happens outside of it and when a black hole is in a binary with another star the extreme gravity of the black hole can actually pull matter from the companion star if it is close by and matter from that uh, star crosses what is called the lagrangian point we will not go into that then it can attract that matter and that matter forms a disk around that black hole and as that matter flows around the black hole it becomes hotter and hotter and then it starts emitting in at million degree kelvin and therefore you can observe that radiation in x rays and that is how cygnus x1 the first black hole candidate was discovered and it was actually observed in x rays 
of course it was finally confirmed to be a black hole by our uh, dis by finding its optical companion and so on next slide so what uh, so x rays are very useful to actually study compact objects like black holes and also neutron stars which we can't directly observe in optical but we can observe around them in x rays so now i hope you have understood much of what i told you in this slide which i presented in the beginning so it is a multi wavelength satellite it can it has five instruments it can observe in ultraviolet and in x rays and it is in a low earth orbit yeah a little bit more about the instruments next slide it has i told you five experiments all these five experiments are actually delivered by various institutions of india the ue imaging telescope is an imaging telescope it operates from 130 nanometers to 300 nanometers and actually this is called this two there are two telescopes one operating in near ultraviolet from 200 to 300 nanometers and another one which is far uv which is from 130 to 180 nanometers this uv imaging telescope is delivered by the indian institute of astrophysics which is in bangalore of course the optics is developed by isro the first time ultraviolet optics is developed for space instrumentation um uh, and the detector itself is developed by canadian space agency the next one is soft x ray telescope it operates as i told you there is we use the unit ev don't worry about it it operates from 0.3 kv to 8 kv kilo electron volts the soft x ray telescope is developed by tata institute of fundamental research mumbai and it is the first time we have uh um, developed in india an x ray telescope x ray telescopes are very different from uh, optical telescopes because they operate under grazing incidence so they have to be um, the, the uh, optics has to be uh, kept not horizontally like optical but they have to be kept vertically and then we have the large area x ray proportional counters which are gas filled counters three numbers as i as is shown in the figure they are large proportional counters and very very contain very high pressure gas of two atmospheres why is it needed because they have to operate up to 80 kilo electron volts and so these x rays have to be absorbed like by the photoelectric effect within the gas so this lax pc operates from 3 to 80 kilo electron volts then we have called something called the cadmium zinc telluride imager it is a solid state detector called cas it is something like uh, what is used in um, your ccds but it is a different material which can go to very very high energies and therefore it can operate from 25 to 100 kilo electron volts so as you can see there is a starting from soft x ray telescope till the cadmium zinc telluride we can cover the energy range all the way from 0.3 kilo electron volts to 100 kilo electron volts so <clears throat> if you see it is two um, it is a factor of nearly 1000 which we cover with these three instruments 
as i told you in optical it is only from 300 to 700 nanometers which is a factor of only 2 but here we are using instruments to cover a factor of 100 nearly 1000 in energy range why is this important is because we want to cover the spectrum from the optic from the x ray emitting stars over this wide energy range and so astrosat is the only satellite in the world which is now operating in both far uv and x rays there are telescopes operating in near uv and far uv there are telescopes operating in x rays and near uv but there is no telescope which operates in the far uv and x rays and i already and there is the fifth instrument which i told which i didn't tell you it is a scanning x ray monitor which monitors the sky which rotates and monitors the sky for transients next slide supriya okay so how do we get this data from these instruments most of you will be familiar with imaging data image means image of the source which uh, you can see that uh, uh, it can tell you about features of an object morphology it can tell you about the position of the source it can tell you whether there are multiple stars or is it one single star etc so we uv uv it is actually imaging in near uv and far uv so you can see these two images very very look very very different the far uv on the right hand side is containing very very few stars so um, because it scans the very very hot objects in a particular stellar system next slide <clears throat> in addition to imaging can you go to the next slide to priya i think you didn't yeah yes, so this is what is the imaging data and so you can see the images in nuv and far uv images what you are familiar with because um, eyes also do imaging so next uh, slide next we also do what is called temporal data what is what is meant by that next slide supriya yeah if you switch on a bulb and switch it off you can see the bulb switching on and switching switching off right but if you measure that intensity as a function of time it is called what we call temporal data or light curve so if an a star for example uh, is very 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 faint and then suddenly it switches on we can see the intensity varying with time so on the right hand side for example is a light curve of a gamma ray burst so normally it has counts of the order of 25 but suddenly it goes to peaks to a count of nearly 100 so and then again it comes down within a very very short time of millisecond or few seconds so that is why it is called a burst okay so so i told you these lights are light is emitted as individual packets so we actually count every photon which is incident on our detectors in astrosat each of the instruments actually measures every single photon which is incident on our detectors so intensity of the source as number of counts per integration time and what does it tell you it can tell you about rotation period it can tell you about arrival times it can tell you about binary period for example we can measure the rotation period of a neutron star we can measure bursts we can measure flares etc next slide supriya so we do imaging we do temporal data we also do what is called spectral data 
I told you white light can be broken up into red, green, blue, etc. That is this. That is what is called spectrum of white light. Now, um, if you measure the spectrum in, um, say, in X-rays, you will see what is seen on the left hand side. You will see a continuum. and over it you will see several lines this is a spectrum of a supernova remnant called tycho we say that many much of the elements which are formed in which are which we see carbon nitrogen oxygen etc are actually cooked in supernovae and how, how do we know this because we see the lines from in x rays from these elements from supernovae now a little more simple is you can also see absorption lines in the solar spectrum as dark lines some of you would have heard about fraunhofer lines right these are called absorption spectrum so if it is absorbing uh, the left hand side is an emission spectrum this right hand side is an absorption spectrum in white light in optical next slide so let me go on to describe some of the results which we have from astrosat i will not describe all the results but i will just tell you the salient results which which you might be able to appreciate okay so this is an image of a galaxy the center center image is the image of a galaxy called ngc 2336 it is a spiral galaxy like our uh, uh, milky way the same galaxy was imaged by galax a nasa satellite few years back the galax had a little slightly poorer resolution so this is the left hand side image now you can see if you have a much better resolution um we have about 3 to 4 times better resolution than galax so you can see many 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 of these stars or star regions much better resolved in this center image so and you can see this um on the left hand side red arrow it is actually another galaxy and you can see on the right hand side these dots which are the red dots um this are so many star forming regions have been individually identified over 70 star forming regions have been identified using the uwit data so what are the star forming regions i told you many of the galaxies have regions where new stars are being formed and this is more so in the spiral arms so you will see these are very bright in uv and therefore we can identify these individual regions and is it only in spiral galaxies no we have identified several star forming regions in dwarf galaxies we have identified also in mergers of galaxies several galaxies actually uh, interact with each other and form mergers even in those mergers we have seen star forming new star forming regions yeah next slide <clears throat> um this is uh, this slide okay next slide you can go to yeah but so next slide i am going to talk to you about what is called globular clusters these are clusters of stars um these are clusters of stars which are um, having over tens of thousands of 
starts within a small region and i have shown you the picture will come now yes yeah so on the left hand side is ngc 288 it is also a globular cluster but it is less it is very loosely packed globular cluster on the right hand side on the other hand you see ngc 1851 which is a very tightly packed globular cluster both of these have several thousand stars but um, you see how this is what i call morphology we can take pictures of these uh, globular clusters within few tens of seconds you can take the complete picture and we can resolve each of these stars okay so now um why are clusters so important it was it is thought that clusters co evolve that means they all form at the same time they might have similar ages and they all might die at the same time however now what we are finding is that there are different populations in many of these clusters of stars in fact in a loosely bound ngc 288 on the left hand side we have identified several branches of stars in this galaxy and also on in 1851 the outer outer stars are much more blue and they are therefore bright in fuv and the red portion is the inner portion is bright in near ultraviolet so um <clears throat> some of these stars are actually very very hot and they are called blue stragglers why are they called stragglers because the overall age of these clusters is we find that they are very old but then how do young blue objects come we think now based on the uvit data we think there is mass transfer and therefore these blue stragglers might have acquired mass from a binary star and therefore they are newly born and therefore blue next slide supriya okay so um uh, now i come to x ray uh, x ray uh, results um i told you we want to study the spectrum so you can see on the left hand side spectrum of a source called cygnus x3 we don't know whether this this is a binary which has a compact object we don't know whether that compact object is a neutron star or a black hole but uh, what i want to tell you is this is spectra these different colors are spectra taken within few days or few months for example um, and you can see how the spectra changes so sometimes there is a lot of high energy on the right hand side high energy photons sometimes that is reduced so why does this why does why do these uh, black hole binaries actually behave like this is something which we are all studying so they actually go through an evolutionary cycle i mean i won't say evolutionary cycle they should go through a cycle of going from uh, what we call a hard state to a soft state and therefore they have more accretion and then they come back to lower accretion so this is a cycle which many of these black hole binaries follow and on the right hand side there is another black hole binary which shows very various variations in light curve and so it has 13 types of variabilities called and it's called grs 1915 plus 105 and it is a black hole which has a, a black hole 
of about 20 solar masses. And also it indicates quasi-periodic oscillations of about four hertz. So these things vary with so fast, four hertz is four cycles in one second, right? This is all occurring outside of the event horizon of the black holes. Yeah, next slide. <clears throat> then when we come to surface of neutron stars, we can see thermonuclear bursts. What are these? These are explosions like hydrogen or helium bombs, matter which is accreted on the surface of the neutron star actually gets compacted and therefore they can go off like bombs and they release energies of the order of 10 to the power 39 ergs. It is equivalent of energy emitted by sun over a whole week and it is about 10 to the power 20 times that of the Nagasaki bomb and this whole energy is emitted within a few seconds. Okay. Uh, there's a, it's not uh, hast, it is actually last for a few seconds. And we have found one such source called 1636 minus 536, where the repetition rate of this so called burst is so quick within a few, few minutes. Again, another burst comes and again another burst comes. So there is a rare triple burst which we observe with our um, black PC instrument. Next slide. Um, and then I told you neutron stars rotate very, very, very fast. Um, so this is a light curve of uh, the crab pulsar. It rotates every 33 millisecond, okay? What is a millisecond? A blink of an eye is about 330 millisecond. So this is within one tenth of a blink of the eye, it rotates this neutron star, which has mass of two times the mass of the earth, it rotates. So. Um, these are all fast spinners which we have studied with the U, um, which we have studied using the um, astrosat and many many X-ray pulsars. We can study the spin profiles and because we can see uh, till high energies of 80 kV, we can see the variation in this profile with energy also. Next slide, Supriya. Okay, now this slide, this slide, I want to tell you about a discovery made by uh, uh, Astrosat. Uh, see, there is Lyman continuum emission. Lyman continuum, many of you would have heard, those who are few who are in college would have heard about Balmer series, Lyman series of hydrogen. See, Lyman series um, is a series of emission which falls from um, a shorter than 1200 angstroms. So, um, so it is, so Lyman continuum itself is having a wavelength of around 900 angstroms, very, very short wavelength. So, this Lyman series, Lyman emission can come from very, very early universe. So this is one of the indicators of, if you detect Lyman emission, it means it can give indications of how stars might have emitted in early universe. So it is a signature, but we have, we have detected with the UV telescope, both extreme UV, which is red shifted, and the Lyman continuum, which is red shifted, from a clumpy galaxy at Z equal to 1.42, at a red shift of 1.42. I won't go into what is red shift, etc. 
but what is important about this result is other satellites you can see on the right hand side other satellites have and ground based observatories have detected similar alignment continuum up to z equal to 0.5 on the left hand, left hand side and on the right hand side beyond z equal to 2.5 but between 0.5 and 2.5 no detection was made from ground based or from space based telescope even from hubble space telescope but we you we studied one of the hubble space telescope deep fields and we find this clumpy galaxy which is indicated by the red star on the right hand side figure the first of its kind in this and this z so it is uh, so uh, the many many and first time we also detected red shifted extreme uv in our fuv camera so it has potential to discover many such galaxies in the deep fields yeah with that uh, i will go to my last slide um uh, so i hope i have impressed upon you the wonderful results which are coming from astrostat we have now studied over 1400 sources of different types and as you can see in this figure we have covered large portions of the sky and <clears throat> it it has been nearly 7 years in orbit and we hope it will be continue for many many more years uh, the data etc comes from the indian space science data center iss dc um, and the website is www.issdc.gov.in i might mention shrinath sir who is leading your creative team is actually now in charge of uh, making sure that the data is available on this website and girish sir who is also a member of the creative team actually make sure that the operation that the proposals are received proposal is uh, um, uh, vetted by the co committees respective committees and that it is op the operations are done at the required times so you have two very very active creative members as focal points in this satellite and so with those words i thank you all for the patient listening and i am ready to answer any of your questions thank you ma'am i'll unmute everyone who want to ask the questions you can raise your hand and ask the questions giride sir yes ma'am hello ha ah, sir uh, thank you so yes, much ma'am actually it's very nice uh, presentation uh really we are very proud of our uh, astrosat uh, may i know what are the similarities uh, between the our astrosat and uh, us made uh, hubble uh, telescope ma'am and also what are the differences uh, between uh, uh, these ma'am astrosat and uh, hubble telescope okay hubble space telescope is actually operating originally it was operating in optical and infrared but now they are later because of their uh, refurbishment they have an ultraviolet camera and therefore uh, they can uh, they can observe in optical infrared and ultraviolet but hubble space telescope does not have any x ray instruments yeah in fact hubble space telescope has much to better resolution in ultraviolet than we have in astrosat but they have to if they have to make an image of a galaxy because their resolution is extremely good they have to make many 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 um, yeah, many uh, what do you call observations to make the complete 
image of a galaxy whereas we have a large field of view of nearly half a degree so with the uv imaging telescope we can take image of a galaxy within a very very short time so within a uh, short time we can in fact may image multiple galaxies sometimes when they are close by yeah and we have as i said the ours is the only satellite which have which has far uv and x rays together thank you ma'am thank you so much rakshit rakshita excuse me ma'am mm. yes does, uh, does eclipse occur in other planets also ma'am pardon does eclipse occur in other planet also ma'am oh yes um eclipses are geometric phenomena right so if there are uh, and planetary system, we now know that there are several several over thousands of uh, planets beyond our solar system and there are several planetary systems also and many of them will also have satellites so it is a geometric phenomena when the when the star is eclipsed by the moon uh, of the planet you can see the stellar eclipse and when uh, when the moon is eclipsed by the planet then you can see the moon eclipse right so that can occur in any planetary system which has planets and moons and of course it has a star thank you guna uh, just a uh, second just to add uh, further to dr sita madam recently the perseverance which is landed on the mars has taken the eclipse of uh, uh, what we called uh, the phobos you can see it in uh, google it is available thank you okay guna good afternoon ma'am sita ma'am um you are mu muted ma'am ma'am my question is how heavy are the things that is asked ma'am ma pardon Mama, how heavy and how large is AstroSat, and how expensive is it, ma? Ah, very good. I didn't tell you. Okay, uh, the AstroSat overall satellite is um around uh, it is fifteen fifteen kg one five one five kg thousand five hundred and fifteen kg. Out of which the experiments themselves are around eight hundred and sixty kg. Now the satellite itself. the center part of the satellite is of the order of one it's a it's a cuboid of the order of 1 and 1/2 meter by 1 and 1/2 meter or so but with the solar panels the solar panels extend about 2 meters beyond that central cuboid thank you ashit Ma'am, good evening, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, in June 2018, in Astronomical Journal, there was an uh, article was published that you have also mentioned, ma'am, about the gamma ray burst. They have yeah. mentioned that these gamma rays burst are reverse in time. Can you explain it a bit uh, briefly, ma'am? Okay. See, we are with the uh, AstroSat. specifically with the cadmium zinc telluride imager we have actually detected over 500 gamma ray bursts yeah okay now what is reversal gamma ray burst are intense intense energy emission within a very short time of few seconds sometimes even few milliseconds why is it called reversal is 
because we know we uh, we know now now we know that gamma ray bursts occur at cosmological distances that means they are very 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 far occurring from us so what we detect today as a gamma ray burst might have occurred several million light years away and therefore also several million years before um before than present time because it takes that much time to traverse the distance and reaches yeah so one of the theories is that some of these gamma ray bursts could be due to gravitational mergers of black holes which occurred long back but which we are seeing now which we the signature of which we are seeing now even the light which we see now actually when we see it from very far away we have to correct for what we call the red shift does that answer your question harshit yes ma'am but it is appearing like uh, it is uh, um it is coming back uh, to our earth like uh, it's it is on falling on some surface which is uh, reflecting back to the earth it's like and it's appearing like a light which is reflecting from a surface ma'am that's what the general says i, I didn't understand uh, clearly no, but uh, today i got uh, the chance to no, gamma ray burst gamma ray burst themselves are actually emitted in gamma rays only of course you can see the counterparts in x rays and in optical later and from that only we have found that some of these may be due to supernovae or hypernovae and some of these may also be due to mergers but you might have also read about what is called cherenkov radiation now cherenkov radiation are uh, the light which is gamma rays which interact with the atmosphere of the earth and they form what is called a um, shower cherenkov shower is what it is called these are extremely high gamma rays so uh, you might have read about that also just check what you have read about madam he is an enthusiastic uh, astronomy reader but he works in uh, education department as an assistant just okay so yeah so cherenkov radiation is actually gamma radiation uh, forming showers in the atmosphere it actually uh, forms uh, charged particle showers yeah i read it back in 2018 ma'am just i re remembering in a raw way uh, yeah i will go it might be a recovery yes okay any more questions giri sir anything you like to discuss or anything now i just want to say thank you to dr sita uh, for a comprehensive introduction to astrosat and uh, making that uh, people get more interested in uh, more interested in uh, uh, astronomy and india's uh, science missions etc so thank you very much ma'am thank you girish thank you, and uh, as i told you girish and shrinath are uh two pillars of the astrosat so i hope you will get much, many many more talks about the operation how data is dis disseminated etc etc from them also in the future <laughs> yes ma'am thank you ma'am thank any you. any questions uh someone asking can we get astrosat data ah uh, yes astrosat data is actually made open however it can be used better by uh, scientists at present uh, we are trying to see if uh, uh, we can actually make 
small projects for uh, college students we are in the process but it might take some time because we'll have to reduce that data further and further so that it can be used by uh, school and college students at present it is not in that form it is it is possible for scientists to use that data okay any questions okay. one more ah uh, guna you can ask yes ma'am ma'am uh, where will the uh, where will astrosat get its power from ma'am it gets its power from the solar panels you saw those two panels extending beyond in that picture which in that slide which i showed twice those two are the solar panels so when sunlight falls on the solar panel uh, it generates electricity and that is stored in a battery which is inside the satellite so when there is no sun when there is when it goes behind uh, um, the earth when there is no sun then it will take from the battery this one right and again the battery will get charged okay ma'am yeah those those two panels yeah those are the solar panels this one these solar panels can be rotated to point towards the sun mm. thank you okay. ma'am okay ma'am i think uh, we can end here uh, sita ma'am uh, it's uh, very uh, informative and uh, we are uh, be uh, behalf of all uh, uh, who are here uh, rakshit again you want to ask a question last question yes ma'am okay ma'am how many black holes are discovered up to now in our galaxy ma'am oh um actually there are two types of black holes within our galaxy there are a few hundred black hole candidates which have been discovered but um, there are also one more type of black holes which is called the supermassive black hole um we think uh, or many think that uh, every galaxy might host a supermassive black hole at the center our own galaxy milky way has a supermassive black hole at the center similarly every every galaxy might have in which case then it will be billions and billions of supermassive black holes okay okay i think uh, this was last question so we can uh, end here sita ma'am a uh, very informative session uh, thank you very much for your time and your uh, uh, knowledge for sharing for us and we are uh, very thankful uh, uh, for your uh, uh, time thank you ma'am thank you supriya and uh, thanks to all the cre creative team for making this possible any other feedback you can send it to me and uh, also there is one question is there a plan for astrosat 2 yes there are discussions for astrosat 2 however now uh, yes uh, girish etc when it is decided what is going to be astrosat 2 i think they will give a talk ma'am someone uh, asking question why chandrayaan 2 failed yeah this is beyond this is not part of this talk but uh, <laughs> don't say that chandrayaan 2 failed because the chandrayaan 2 orbiter is still working and it is doing very very well there are um, more than uh, six, seven experiments on chandrayaan 2 and uh, orbiter and it is giving very good results so um, i think uh, uh, shama gave a talk on chandrayaan 2 orbiter is that right if i remember right yes ma'am yes ma'am yeah. so the orbiter is still working only the lander and the, and therefore the rover also we lost someone asking your email address ma'am 
any mode of contacting you you can give them my email address however um, please give a subject as creative something connected with creative otherwise i may not even know who is this um, writing to me i uh, uh, shared link of uh, creative whatsapp link in uh, chat box if uh, anybody interested in further uh, details updating details you can join our uh, Uh, whatsapp group there i can uh, you can contact me uh, i'll be admin for that group uh, so that okay, i can share uh, ma'am uh, email id okay okay, okay ma'am yes ma'am uh, thank you ma'am i am 